thanks so much, Boris, and to everyone at TBA21 for inviting me this evening. Um, today, I just really want to tell you a story, so that's what I'm going to do. I am held captive by the idea that we are all bodies of water. I mean this in the first sense that all planetary living beings, animals, plants, fungi, protoctists, monera, are mostly watery. As we well know, we humans are at least two-thirds sopping, spongy, and wet. But I also mean this in a gestational sense. We are all bodies of water, in that water is also a creative milieu for all life. Right back to the first signs of life on Earth at least 3.9 billion years ago, when small organic proteins likely interacted with their habitat to produce the first bacterial life forms, water has been necessary for the gestation of all living beings. Our earliest ancestors were all apparently water babies, squirming, scuttling, or swimming around their respective watery worlds. As watery, we all owe ourselves to other bodies of water. As watery, we all eventually pass our waters on. We rely on water for our continued proliferation, but we are also reservoirs for this proliferating force of life in the plural. Our planetary hydrocommons, in this sense, is not just a network of interconnected geophysical and meteorological waters. It is also made up from all bodies that materialize and transform these waters in their own fur and flesh. Imagining ourselves as part of an embodied hydrocommons, I suggest, might then also ask some ethical questions about our responsibility to the waters that we come from and about our accountability for the waters that we pass on. So today's lesson in hydrofeminism is about our own fishy beginnings. We could call this evolution, but if we do, let's be clear about what that means. It's a lesson in where we come from, but as Donna Haraway writes, quote, there is no border where evolution ends and history begins, where genes stop and environment takes up, where culture rules and nature submits or vice versa. Instead, she writes, there are turtles upon turtles of nature cultures all the way down. Every being that matters is a congeries of its formative histories, all of them. In other words, hydrofeminist evolution stories are not just biological tales. As we will see, evolution is also where a phylogenetic memory rests in the spleen, where an ancestor is gathered up in a carrier bag, where whales and fish swim through our flesh in lost loving echoes. While the evolution stories that I want to tell tonight are both fact and fable, they are all real, and they all help shape how we understand our own bodies of water and how we understand our relationship to other bodies of water. Again, following Donna Haraway, I would suggest that this kind of storytelling then is also a way of making kin, a way of recognizing our strange and wondrous kinships owing to and coming from the watery world. As a mode of hydrofeminism, though, this evolutionary lesson is uninterested in a reinstatement of family values through evolutionary lines. Indeed, Mother Ocean is crucial for our proliferation as bodies of water, but we also need queerer stories of sexual difference and multi-species love and stories that shake down the evolutionary tree. So what better place, what better place to start than with feminist sci-fi writer Ursula Le Guin? In Le Guin's essay, The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, she refers to a writer from the 1970s, Elizabeth Fisher, and Fisher's discussion of human evolution. According to Fisher, um, the earliest cultural inventions were probably not sharp tools or spears, but rather a container, a container to hold gathered products in some kind of sling or net carrier. Carrying, in other words, according to Elizabeth Fisher, is the first trick that humans learned to do. For Le Guin, the key point here is that she can recognize herself in this evolution story. In place of sagas of man the hunter with his animal killing spears, Le Guin finds a more capacious tale in which to root herself. It grounds me personally, Le Guin writes, in human culture in a way I never felt grounded before. 
so long as culture was explained as originating from and elaborating upon the use of long, hard objects for sticking, bashing, and killing, writes Le Guin, I never thought I had or wanted any particular share of it. Fisher and Le Guin's story of the carrier bag makes sense. Killing mammoths, after all, was hard work and probably didn't happen very often. Foraging was probably a lot more common. If you don't have something to put it in, as Le Guin notes, food will escape you. But it's also a more feminist origin story. That's, of course, not to say that women aren't aggressive. As Le Guin herself notes, she is often hangry, angry, and she'd happily club a hoodlum over the head with her handbag. But it just means that aggression and killing things with spears doesn't have to be the story that makes sense of it all. In Le Guin's words, the carrier bag story is more inclusive and does away with tired hero narratives. This in itself is another good reason to tell it. But for my purposes tonight, Le Guin also notes that the point of a carrier bag is that it holds things. And more than that, it holds things in a particular powerful relation to each other and to us. Holding things and holding things in relation seems a very good hydrofeminist lesson to take away from these evolution stories. Watery embodiment, after all, is all about being in relation. But it also leads me to wonder, what if we push Le Guin's tale even a little further? What if we ourselves, as bodies of water, are also evolutionary carrier bags? What if we as watery bodies are carrier bags that hold things and hold things in relation? Isn't this what we humans have done at an evolutionary scale, literally incorporating water in which we once swam? As Deleuze and Guattari put it, when the seas dried, the primitive fish left its associated milieu to explore land forced to stand on its own legs, now carrying water on the inside in the amniotic membranes protecting the embryo. Here, Deleuze and Guattari are referring to the terrestrial invasion and the evolution of mammalian life. But turning our watery habitat outside in was necessary for all life on land. Evolutionary scientists Mark and Diana McMenamin describe this as hypersea, that is, the interconnected system of terrestrial life that has extended the sea onto the earth, taking it along for the ride. On land, they write, the life sustenance that was passively accessible in a marine environment has to be actively facilitated through increasingly complex networks of microscopic organisms, fungi and plants, as well as animals, both human and otherwise, dependent on symbiosis, physical connection, and proximity. They write that without the sea to serve as a prime communicator and facilitator, life on land needed to chart its own water courses, most available in the watery tissues and body fluids of other life forms. And so this is how we too became carrier bags. Hypersea is also an example of lateral processes of evolution that disturb teleological views of evolution by filial descent. In order to survive and proliferate life further, once on land, terrestrial species needed to dig stealth channels through each other. Terrestrial life thus engaged in various fluid exchanges that betrayed their filiative boundaries. For example, arthropods, arthropods rather, likely the first terrestrial animals, invited fungi and other microbes into their bellies to help them digest plant matter. Through such symbiotic relations, the bodily fluids of land vertebrates ended up serving as evolutionarily important reservoirs of hypersea. This makes a significant contribution, write the McMenamins, to the total species diversity of organisms on land. In other words, as hypersea, we are carrier bags not only for our own descendants, in whom we may have a sovereign vested interest, but also for entirely different and distant species. As hypersea, we gestate life that has no relation to our own family line. Or, put otherwise, we gestate life with whom our connection is only water. Hypersea thus makes evolution somewhat queer. The reproductively sexual female is not the only body who becomes a watery womb for others. While life begins in water, 
Gestation does not begin and end with that mammalian womb, nor does evolution tumble out neatly and matrilineally from Mother Ocean. Hypercy doesn't do away with the importance of feminine or maternal bodies, but it does ask us to make evolution stories a little less straight. While Hypercy tells the evolutionary tale of bodies that came out of the sea and learned to stand on their own two feet, some of us also returned to the sea. In Italian writer Italo Calvino's story, The Aquatic Uncle, there is a character named Nba Nga, who is the paternal uncle of the protagonist, Quiffic. Quiffic is the time-traveling narrator of Calvino's book, Cosmicomics. And in this particular chapter, The Aquatic Uncle, Quiffic describes the time that the water period was coming to an end. Life, which had previously existed only in the ocean, was becoming terrestrial. And so Quiffic tells us that for most, this was a period of excitement. Unfortunately, his embarrassing uncle, a lobefish from the extinct species of Coelacanthus, refuses to let go of the ocean. Inba Inga refuses to even contemplate that things might be better out there. He insists on staying mired in the equitonal muck. He has a penchant for nonsensical fishy proverbs, and he can only measure the world through the logic of water columns and currents. Hypercy, it seems, was clearly, was clearly not on Nba Inga's radar. As Quiffic puts it, it just wasn't possible to make him accept a reality different than his own. The mortification that Quiffic experiences, though, is not only that his uncle is out of step with this terrestrial zeitgeist. Worse than that, Inba Nga lures Quiffic's fiance, Lil, back into the water. Inba Nga and Lil fall in love, and she, she relearns how to swim. We know that 19th century naturalist, biologist, and philosopher Ernst Haeckel got it wrong when he suggested that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Evolution does not progress up through increasingly sophisticated species in the same way that a human begins as zygote and becomes amphibian, eventually turning into a full-fledged, air-breathing, bipedal man. Citing fish as a particular telling example, phenomenologist Maurice uh, Merleau-Ponty reminds us that we do not find either less numerous or simpler types by going back in the history of the earth. So when Lil rejects Quiffic in order to join Inba Inga in his aquatic life, this is not a regression as in some kind of progress thwarted or a reversal of evolutionary teleology. Watery evolution stories disturb a clean linearity of forward and back, even if we often frame stories like Lil's as a return. Lil doesn't regress, but rather selects another possibility. Yet despite Ernst Haeckel's technical missing the mark, I can understand where he's coming from. After all, what expectant human mother has not at some point imagined her fetus as tadpole, all fish eyes and fins, preamphibious, somersaulting its way through her amniotic seas? Her pasts literally well up inside her, time a crumpled up tissue, now responding to the swell. Something is remembered, a tail reabsorbed, an aorta hooked. Perhaps the water, watery body, bodies we gather in our carrier bags are also memories of a could have been, past traces of our own amphibious futures not yet lived. Lest these rememberings all sound a bit too fabulated, we could also call on the work of Sandor Ferenczi, erstwhile student and pen pal of Sigmund Freud. In a theory that he reluctantly published only late in life, Ferenczi suggested that dreams of water recall not only the trauma of birth as we are expelled from our mother's wombs, but also the phylogenetic catastrophe of the drying up of the seas, a loss we tetrapods have shouldered for millennia. Countless tales from patients of fishy dreams, watery trauma and briny passions lead Ferenczi to wonder, and this is a quote from him, what if the entire intrauterine existence of higher mammals were only a replica of the type of existence which characterized that aboriginal piscine period, and birth itself nothing but a recapitulation on the part of the individual of the great catastrophe which at the time of the recession of the ocean forced so many animals, and certainly our own animal ancestors, 
to adapt themselves to a land existence. Our traumas are personal, says Ferenczi, but they are also phylogenetic, even, eco even geological, we could add. As Ferenczi aimed to clarify in his thalassal proposition, our bodies harbor the memory of the terrestrial invasion and a forsaking of the sea. Ferenczi postulates a shared symbolism that is more than semiotics. It is an embodied collective memory and a phylogenetic recognition of our descent from aquatic vertebrates. Desire, loss, sociality, grief. These phenomena are biological as much as they are psychological or cultural. Ferenczi called this a matter of the biological unconscious. Freud apparently was not impressed. And to add scientific insult to psychoanalytic injury, Ferenczi's theories were based in part on Ernst Haeckel's findings, which we know have been established as flawed. But just because evolution did not necessarily unfold from less developed fish fry to more sophisticated biped, the idea of watery return isn't fully washed away. It repeats the evolution of cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises, who followed a very ev different evolutionary trajectory where watery pasts and futures are queerly sutured together. Cetaceans, not fish, but air-breathing mammals, help us imagine not only how our own bodies harbor traces of aquatic evolutionary pasts, but also how they hold latent watery potentials of evolutionary futures not chosen. When Darwin was writing his theories of evolution, the origin stories of whales were something of a mystery, although he did muse that a race of bears could have conceivably evolved into whales. While his speculations were for the most part laughed right out of subsequent printings of On the Origin of Species, we now think that Darwin's suggestion was not as ludicrous as it once sounded. As one recent story tells it, the closest known terrestrial relative to the whale was Indochius, a fox-sized, deer-like land mammal that did not like meat at all but rather spent long amounts of time in the water in order to avoid becoming someone else's dinner. Eventually, with not a lot of other choice, Indohius developed a taste for fish and for a more aquatic lifestyle all around. These land dwellers eventually learned to swim deeper, their legs grew shorter, their feet grew webbing, and they became part of the genealogy of whales, in which walking and swimming whales lived side by side. Eventually, the walkers died out, and by about 40 million years ago, whales were thriving with an officially changed mailing address. As modern humans, we share considerable bodily connectivity with whales and other cetaceans. We both have lungs that breathe air and giant brains wrinkled with neocortex. We both function best when our bodies are at about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. We both survived in infancy on a diet of our mother's milk. Peel back the blubber of a cetacean's fin and you will see something not unlike your own human hand. Five fingers, a wrist, an elbow, a shoulder. We are both social animals. We both gestate our babies within watery wombs and then spend inordinate amounts of time training our young for life without us. In terms of what we consider smarts, the Brazilian river dolphin leads the cetacean pod as our closest runner up with other primates as only a somewhat distant second. Most commonly accepted theories of human evolution revolve around the savanna theory, whereby forest-dwelling apes literally came down from the trees and became plains-dwelling hunters. They learned to run on two legs and use tools or weapons, as we already heard. They eventually became man. But a housewife and TV producer in the 60s and 70s in England named Elaine Morgan was skeptical of this theory. Drawing on the 1960s science of a man named Sir Alistair Hardy, who speculated about the existence of hydrophilic apes as a key element of human evolution, Elaine Morgan became, until her death just a few years ago, a staunch proponent of what has become known as the aquatic ape theory of evolution not least by considering more carefully the place of females in the descent from ape to hominid, Morgan suggested that something else needed to explain the differences between humans and existing apes. Because although our similarities are well noted, we also exhibit considerable differences. These include structural differences in our skeletons, muscles, skin, and brains, Differences in posture and locomotion, differences in social organization, differences in capacity for speech and intellect. 
Other not easily explained human departures from our primate kin include a naked fetus, a hairless human adult who nonetheless maintains a strange wealth of head hair, mostly, <laughs> large deposits of subcutaneous fat, and not least innate diving reflexes and swimming infants. And none of these traits is very ape-like. So Morgan's story goes like this. During a gap in the human history fossil record, large swaths of the African continent were flooded by seas. During this time, some apes did indeed come down from the trees and become not hunters of the savanna, but semi-aquatic coastal dwellers. They spent their days diving and swimming and living along the pebbly shores of these vast bodies of water. Perhaps this ape needed to stay warm in the water, so she developed a nice cushion of subcutaneous insulation. Although she lost her hair, perhaps to become more hydrodynamic, she nonetheless held on to the thick tresses on her head, allowing it to in fact grow thicker during pregnancy so that her infant would have somewhere to cling while they paddled about the, set, the sea together. Perhaps in water where scent signals lose their usefulness and subtle visual cues are obscured, this ape needed to find her voice. Perhaps she developed her fine sense of balance and a predilection to stand on her own two feet when she first waded tentatively into increasingly deep water. Because of the fossil record gap, neither the aquatic ape theory nor the savanna theory can be irrefutably proven. Morgan maintains that the aquatic ape theory simply makes more sense. It requires fewer stretches of the imagination and fewer instances of convoluted logic. While her theories, not unlike Darwin's race of bears, were initially the subject of considerable scorn within the scientific community, more recently some evolutionary biologists have returned to the aquatic ape theory with keen interest. But the definitive truth of this story is not really my point. We already know that origin stories are always somewhat of a muddle. I'm interested instead in the aquatic ape theory's appeal. What is it about Morgan's version that calls to us, that asks the echoes in our salty tear ducts and our watery wombs to respond? Might this appeal stem from a kind of embodied empathy, a biological or phylogenetic memory, as Sandra French would say, of a watery return not chosen, a path back to the sea not taken? Isn't this what our human mammalian diving reflex or a newborn infant's instinctual capacity to swim in some ways demonstrates? Although Ernst Haeckel was wrong, I'm still intrigued by the power of a wrong theory. Perhaps the endurance of Haeckel's idea of a return to the sea is less about the fossil record and more about an attunement to our own fishiness, to our own cetacean, almost ancestry. Understood this way, perhaps Ferenczi's suggestion that our organs remember and that our bodies are archives of deep times and tangled genealogies does not seem that strange. Philosopher Alfonso Lingus describes our human bodies as, quote, coral reefs full of polyps, sponges, gorgonians, free-swimming macrophages continually stirred by monsoon climates of moist air, blood, and biles. This is a rather queer elemental genealogy we have, descend descended from and gathering up the hermaphroditic seas and the watery deep time weather. Or in the words of feminist philosophers Hélène Sixou and Catherine Clément, we ourselves are seas, sands, corals, seaweeds, beaches, tides, swimmers, children, waves, seas, and mothers. While the language these philosophers use takes part of its power from metaphor, neither description is mere metaphor. These echoes are the amplification of a potential we already hold as elemental and animal bodies, gathering up and repeating our tangled evolutionary pasts. Perhaps this is an extended kind of echolocation across scrambled genealogies and symbiotic generations. If we were not somehow materially in contact with these experiences, the metaphor would hold no sway. We verify this bodily empathy because our own embodiment soaks up and holds traces of our watery body's deep potentialities, what we might have been, what we still might become, tucked away in and as our bodies as carrier bags. You might find yourself sinking 
a bit breathless in this undertow of affect, memory, science and fable, gut feelings, fossil records, body archives, and biological psyche. In imagining ourselves as aqueously extended across space and time, but also suspended between ostensible fact and so-called fiction, we draw on all of our sensory apparatuses to find different kinds of stories to tell. These stories are the tales of scientists, but they are also fabulous and figurative. We carry them in our baggy imaginations, and they are written into our swampy humors. The echoes in our bones are literally the debris of worlds past. That oceanic feeling helps us think about water, both individual bodies of water and entire species as bodies of water, in terms of a gestational milieu that connects us all. My wager tonight is that these evolutionary stories give us the means for amplifying our own watery debts. We carry these debts as watery carrier bags in a constantly shifting network of potentialities in a queer time that anticipates the past and remembers the future. Yet there are some aspects of our fishy beginnings that we will never be able to live. These stories also de dissolve beyond our capacities to tell them. Water, as a larger geographical body, places limits on our abilities to survive in relation to water. Water calls out our species-differentiated capacities and challenges our deficiencies and limitations. So when Alfonso Lingus tests these limits, he describes what happens when we try to go back to the water. And here's another quote from him. 170 pounds of salty brine mostly in, a, in an unshapely sack of skin. What a clumsy weight to have to transport out on bony legs. When we return to the ocean, we have to pull a layer of rubber skin over our bodies, strap on a buoyancy compensator, an air tank with regulator and gauges, weight belt, eye mask, flippers. And then how ludicrous we look when we lurch our bodies, equipped with all of these prosthetic organs, out of the dive shop and wade with flippered feet across the beach till we reach the deep water. In the deep, all these supplementary organs make our own species organs non-functional. Even if we feel an empathy toward our fishy and cetacean kin in our own bodies, there is still a limit to how far we can go to meet each other. In other words, the edge of the water is also a threshold of difference. This threshold does not dissolve our interpermeation in one another's bodies, but it does force the question of what is ultimately livable. A whale out of water, writes Jacques Cousteau, even though it is an air breather, dies very quickly. Despite its incredible power, it simply does not have sufficient strength to breathe in the open air. The pioneering oceanographer further explains, a whale has not the strength nor the limbs to regain the life-giving water. He dies of asphyxiation. Or in the words of Australian writer Rebecca Giggs, witnessing the slow death of a stranded humpback on a beach in Western Australia. This is Rebecca Giggs' quote. While in the ocean, its blubber fat insulates the whale and allows the animal to maintain a constant inner temperature, out of the ocean, the blubber smothers it. Though we humans were now shivering, the whale, only meters away, was boiling alive in the kettle of itself. Despite all the ways in which we humans feel a deep affinity for water and our own cetaceous or fishy beginnings, for our terrestrial bodies, the borders of the livable begin at the water's edge. For our strange cetacean kin, though, this is also where they end, perhaps like this, on a beach, too large to euthanize in any kind of conventional manner, too expensive to blow up with dynamite. For our cetaceous kin, the open air means a demise steeped in slow, inevitable suffering. In other words, watery kinship lives alongside insurmountable alterity. This kin cannot live in our world, nor can we live in theirs. For humans, in terms of our relation to water, this should underscore that intimacy is not mastery. We eventually have to let go of the dorsal fin. The whale will always outswim us, while our own lungs inevitably give out. To follow these resonances of past waters into the deep, we need superpowers or borrowed organs. We will never be able to master that which makes up three quarters of our own sloshy selves. Perhaps all we can do is hover, temporarily, silent and submerged between an inhale and an exhale 
in that tense space of aspiration. Below the surface, our lungs are two inflated balloons that keep us from sinking. In this kind of temporary or ephemeral thoughtful suspension, we might locate a kind of care, an extension of care towards that which calls us to respond. If these aquatic creatures are our strange kin, echoing in us as both our pasts and our potential futures, it is worth considering what we are also gifting to them and to the watery milieu that becomes us all. And perhaps it is here that we can conclude this lesson in hydrofeminism. For after witnessing the humpback smother itself on that Western Australian beach, Rebecca Giggs sought out more information about beached whales. She writes, I learned that in the coastal currents, some whales become entangled in abandoned fishing kit or ingest trash, bags, wrappers, mesh. Because they are so well insulated by that thick layer of blubber, they attract fat-soluble toxins as well, absorbing heavy metals and inorganic compounds found in pesticides, fertilizers, and other pollutants that powder the modern sea. The body of a whale is a magnifier for these insidious agrochemicals, she writes, because cetaceans live a long time and accrue a toxic load from their prey. Levels build up over many seasons, making some animals far more polluted than their surrounding environment. Knowing that the whale on the beach is destined for the municipal waste management facility, Giggs says she's moved to think of the whale as landfill. It was a metaphor, she notes, and then it wasn't. The same could be said about whale as anthropogenic dump. When we consider the ways in which cetaceans and other fishy beginnings echo through our own flesh, we might pause and reflect on the ways in which we also echo through them. Whale bodies literally becoming the detritus of late capitalism. Nor are these echoes metaphoric. Low frequency active military sonar emits sound pressure of 120 decibels, a level that would damage our human ability to hear over vast distances, while mid frequency sonar can emit continuous sound above 235 decibels, which is mostly like a rocket blast off. High intensity sonar and seismic waves snake along the ocean floor, seeking oil and gas deposits. Meanwhile, background noise in the ocean doubles every decade, mostly from commercial shipping traffic. Cetacean deaths sometimes surface as mass strandings, but necropsies show intensive internal bleeding in cranial regions. That is, our sonic echoes in their flesh in an all-too-literal, all-too-material way. The way we pass ourselves on as evolutionary carrier bags to our fishy relations has also become uncannily material. Today, our carrier bag existence has literalized itself. Non-biodegradable white petroleum hauntings masquerading as jellyfish floating on a gyre of deep futures. Again, if we are always potentially becoming cetacean, or becoming fishy, we need to ask, how are our strange aquatic kin becoming us? Similarly, old Imba and Ga, conjured from Italo Calvino's pen in 1965, doesn't quite seem to predict the poisonous gifts that we humans would bestow upon our oceans in the coming decades. Down there, he explains to his nephew and his bride-to-be, Lil, changes would be very few, Space and provender were unlimited. The temperature would always be steady. In short, life would be maintained as it had gone on till then in its achieved perfect forms without metamorphoses or additions with dubious outcome. And every individual, says Nba and Ga, would be able to develop his own nature to arrive at the essence of himself and all things. Even if Nba and Ga didn't conceal the problems, as Quiffic tells us, this version of the ocean world is hardly what we swim in today, nor is this the ocean that swims in us. Life began in the sea, and our bodies have been engaged in various retellings of this origin story ever since. In attending to some of these stories, this lesson in hydrofeminism may be about respecting your ancestors and acknowledging the many waters that grew you up. It may be an imperative, as philosopher Luce Rigorai would have it, to remember the liquid ground. But this remembering is always already rushing ahead of us into the waters that we become. 
How will we pay these gestational gifts forward? What kinds of water worlds are we carrying into the future?